Hi everybody, this is the class session that will save your bacon, meaning you'll go out and work for a nonprofit someday and someone will be inclined to do something that they shouldn't and you'll know enough to stop them. So today we're going to talk about non-charitable behaviors. These are the sorts of things that people sometimes do in nonprofits, even with great intentions, that violate the tax code requirements. So the goals from this class session, I want you to be able to understand the IRS restrictions on private benefit and private annuirement. We're going to talk about what those are. Explain the purpose and effect of intermediate sanctions on what are called excess benefit transactions. And then finally, explain the purpose and effect of laws that prohibit self-dealing in private foundations. Let's start off by talking about private benefit and private annuirement. Um, here are some scenarios, and I want you to think about whether or not these are okay, whether or not you think these should be charitable activities. In this first scenario, you have a foundation that sustains a plantation to act as a historical landmark. Okay. Um, the son of the founder lives on the plantation grounds rent-free, but in exchange for that, he works, so he you know, maintains everything, um, takes care of it, uh, gives tours when people come. But the foundation makes no effort for the um, plantation to be made available to the public. I want you to think about whether or not you think that's okay. And if it's not okay, why do you think it's not okay? Here's the second scenario. A religious organization is incorporated that is controlled primarily by its founders. And the founders are compensated with a share of the income of the organization. So as they get donations from their parishioners, um, the founders get part of that money. Uh, but there's no upper limit on the income sharing. Okay, we're going to talk about that one together in class two. Finally, third scenario, I want you to think about whether or not this should be charitable. Here you have an organization that's formed to trace the genealogy of the Callaway family in America, and they claim that it's for an educational purpose because they're educating people about American history through the Callaway family. But the organization's principal activity is supporting 600 dues-paying members to complete the genealogy. All right. So we'll talk about that one too, whether or not you think that's okay. Um, those three scenarios all invoke the questions of either private benefit or private annuirement. And let's talk about private benefit first. So this is where the private benefit rationale or actually regulations come from. In the tax code, it says that charities should operate exclusively for a charitable purpose. Now, that word exclusive sounds pretty exclusive, meaning there can be no, no other activity other than a charitable one. That's a pretty huge burden, actually, to impose on nonprofits, because how could they, how could they make it so that every single moment of every minute of every employee every day is furthering a charitable purpose? That's actually really high and kind of, in fact, impossible standards. So the regulations interpret exclusively to mean anything other than insubstantial activity. So it, as long as your non-charitable activities are, are, are insubstantial, then that's okay. So only substantial benefits that are not charity will count as private benefit. So if you have employees spending a substantial amount of their time on non-charitable activities, or if you spend your money substantially in a non-charitable way, then that's when um, you violate the private benefit limits. But here's the kicker. The IRS doesn't set a specific threshold for substantiality, meaning if you're engaging in non-charitable activities, then uh, you, the IRS doesn't tell you exactly how much. They don't say, for example, that 10% of your budget is insubstantial. Um, they take it on a case-by-case -case basis. And so the advice here, legally speaking, is that as a nonprofit, you just want to stay away from non-charitable activities as much as is possible or reasonable. Um, this would be, for example, um, overpaying somebody for a contract, or you might uh, decide to uh, let some friends of yours use the use the corp use the nonprofit facilities to host parties on the weekends. Um, these are the sorts of things you just need to stay away from because the assets and resources of the organization are dedicated to charitable purposes. And if the IRS thinks that there's too much of this going on, they will take away your tax exempt status. This is also part of the reason that, um, uh, that uh, unrelated business income matters. We talked about um, this idea, UBI for short. We talked about it 
in the last class session. And, and basically the idea is that if you're going to um, be making a lot of money in non-charitable ways, then that's violating the private benefit standard. Okay, private endearment is a little bit different. Um, it's generally considered in the context of insiders, so we're not really caring about benefits that outside people are getting, but the people who work for or work with the organization. And we're basically going to ask this question, is there any way that the organization's profits are guaranteed to go to an individual? Meaning if the organization makes money, are there any ways in which the money made is guaranteed to go to some private person? Um, <clears throat> it, if any of this is analogous to ownership, if any of it looks like what it would look like if you had shareholders or partners in an organization like that where ownership existed, if it's analogous to ownership, the IRS is going to crack down on it. And so income sharing that's unlimited, where uh, uh, maybe an executive officer gets 5% of everything the organization brings in, that's pretty much analogous to ownership. It's like he owns 5% of the company. And to the extent that's true, the IRS is going to crack down on it. Now, what is the penalty for private benefit and private endearment? Um, if the IRS finds either of them, they are entitled to revoke your tax exempt status, and that's it. That is the only penalty. So they will swoop in, take away tax exempt status. Again, this is called the nuclear option by tax professionals. Um, and the penalties that result from that in terms of people making donations that turn out not to be deductible, past taxes that are owed for the organization's profits, that's the reason they call it the nuclear option because it can be so damaging. So the, the short of it is don't violate the private benefit or private endearment rules. Um, if you're having a hard time understanding the difference between those two, this little graphic will help illustrate it. If, the, if, private, if this circle contains all private benefit that exists, it's going to basically contain all these non-charitable purposes. So if you're engaging in non-charitable activities in a way that's substantial, it's going to fit inside that blue circle. Private endearment is kind of like a special version of this where there are non-charitable benefits flowing to private people, but in a way that's analogous to ownership. And because it looks and acts like ownership, then the IRS is going to call it endearment and crack down on it. Questions we'll talk about in class. How does private benefit differ from private endearment? And then why would we require this for tax exempt status? Okay. Now, I mentioned that if you violate the private benefit rules the IR or endearment rules, then the IRS will push the red button on the nuclear option and revoke your tax exempt status. Well, not that many years ago, Congress re was lobbied to recognize that this is a huge burden um, on an organization for what may have been a very localized and specific benefit to maybe one person. And there are a lot of people that suffer when a nonprofit loses its tax exempt status, and these are innocent people. And so Congress wrote up a set of rules that will apply a penalty just to the people who did the wrong act without taking away exempt status and pushing that nuclear button. And so that's why th these are called intermediate sanctions. Um, the way it works is the code imposes what's called an excise tax on things that are excess in terms of the benefit they provide to other people or excess benefit transactions. Um, this would be paying too much for something is another way to summarize it. If you're paying too much for something, then uh, that's an excess benefit transaction. And so the tax that's imposed is called an intermediate sanction. It's intermediate because it's not as bad as revoking tax exemption. Um, these transactions only occur with a disqualified person. Now the code identifies or defines who's disqualified, who's a disqualified person in, in their relationship with the nonprofit. And so excess benefit transactions only exist if the recipient of the benefit is what the code defines as a disqualified person. That means there's a lot of private endearment and private benefit that will go on that doesn't require intermediate sanctions because if the benefit, if the private benefit goes to somebody who's not a DQP, then it's not an excess benefit transaction. Of course, what that also means is the only solution the IRS has is the red button in revoking tax exempt status. They can't impose an intermediate sanction on a transaction that was, didn't involve a DQP. So who are DQPs? Well, this is the list. Any directors, officers, or managers for the organization, any substantial donors, family members of any of those people, and family means spouses, siblings, 
uh, any ancestors and any descendants and their wives or husbands. And so that's so 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 ancestors, descendants, siblings, and spouses of any of those people. Those are all. Uh, so your cousin, for example, would not be a family member as far as the DQP standard is concerned. And then finally, the last category is if uh, is that a company can be a disqualified person as long as it's at least 35% owned by one or more DQPs. So if I'm a director of the nonprofit and my wife owns 35% of a company, then the company is a DQP because it sort of works its way through the chain. And this DQP standard will reach out as far as the definition allows it to. All right, so what happens if you do give an excess benefit? Like let's say you pay somebody too much in their salary um, and that person is a disqualified person, a DQP. So what, what, uh, what happens? Well, there are three taxes that the IRS can and, and maybe will apply. Um, so the question is who has to pay the tax, why do they have to pay it, and how much do they have to pay? First, we're going to penalize the disqualified person. We're going to penalize them for receiving the excess benefit. And the amount we penalize is 25% of the total. So if I was overpaid $100,000 a year in my salary, that means I'd have to pay back my salary, the excess $100,000 to the nonprofit, and then I'd have to pay $25,000 to the IRS as a penalty. Now, if another group that gets penalized is all the organization managers that participate in the excess benefit. So if I'm a board member and I approve the excess salary of this other person, then I owe the IRS a penalty of 10% of the excess benefit up to $20,000. So if we overpaid somebody $100,000, then I personally, as a board member, have to pay $10,000 to the IRS. There's a third tax, and this goes back on the disqualified person again. And if you fail to remedy the excess benefit, meaning you fail to pay back the excessive amount, then the IRS will impose a 200% penalty. Um, so let's say I, got, I was overpaid by 100 grand. <clears throat> I owe 20. I have to give the 100 grand back to the IRS, and I owe 25,000 dollars. Or I, I have to give the, sorry, the 100 grand back to the nonprofit, and I owe the IRS. Um, $25,000. All the board members that approved my compensation owe $10,000 to the IRS. And finally, the um, if I don't pay the money back to the nonprofit, then I owe the IRS an additional $200,000. So these are pretty scary, and they're deliberately scary because the idea is that we can stop um, people from taking advantage of nonprofit resources. So how do you avoid intermediate sanctions? Well, the first advice is to avoid the burden of proof. Um, what does this mean? Well, basically, if you go into a court and uh, the IRS asserts that there was an excess benefit that took place, now, normally in court, if the government accuses you of something, they have the burden of proof, meaning you're innocent until proven guilty. The way excess benefit transactions work um, and intermediate sanctions work if the IRS makes the claim that there was an excess benefit, then you're, you're guilty until proven innocent. The code is written in such a way as to come down really hard, and so you have to prove that it was not an excess benefit in court. Now, if you engage in some really simple practices ahead of time, the burden of proof actually shifts back to the IRS, and they can't get this guilty until proven innocent thing. And the way you avoid the burden of proof is you make sure that the board approves all compensation for disqualified persons. You make sure that the compensation is set based on comparable data, meaning you look at what salaries are in the marketplace. And you document everything. So you have written documentation of the board decision and its reliance on comparable data. If you do those three things, then the burden of proof shifts back to the IRS and they have to prove that it was an excess benefit rather than getting the presumption that it is. A few other tips for avoiding them. Make sure you identify all the disqualified people in your organization. Know who they are so you can pay attention to how much you're paying them. When you're negotiating contracts or, or, or payments, make sure you negotiate at arm's length. If you have any, you can apply excess benefit. The IRS can find excess benefit for really generous loans where maybe you're loaning money below a market interest rate. So make sure you document and secure any loans, charge a fair interest. And finally, be sure to have and follow a conflicts of interest policy that addresses these issues. 
questions for class. Why are intermediate sanctions a good idea? Why are they a bad idea? It seems really scary. And in fact, a lot of people violate these innocently, at least not with deliberate intent to be overpaid. And should the business judgment rule protect against intermediate sanctions? Because think about it. When we talked about the business judgment rule, we said that as long as their decisions are not bad faith, then board members are okay. But here, even a good faith decision could be penalized. So we'll talk about it together in class. All right, so lastly, let's talk about self-dealing. Self-dealing is kind of like the penalties for intermediate sanctions, but self-dealing only applies to private foundations. So we're not talking about public charities. We're not talking about supporting organizations. We're talking about private foundations, which includes private operating foundations. The self-dealing rules are very strict. Essentially what they say is you cannot engage in any transactions with DQPs no matter what the amount is. So I can't sell exchange or lease property to or from a disqualified person for my private foundation. I can't give any loans or receive any loans. I can't furnish any goods or services. I can't pay them compensation with an exception we'll talk about in a second. In fact, in reality, I can't benefit privately the disqualified person with any of my organization's assets. So again, this isn't about the amount of transaction. With excess benefits, we're talking about overpaying for things. Here we're talking about paying for things at all. So for example, if I own a construction company and I submit a bid to the private foundation where I sit on the board of directors and I, I make it a really cheap bid just to kind of cover my costs so I'm not making any profit, it's also the lowest bid for the nonprofit to accept. So they accept my bid. Um, then, uh, then we just entered into a self-dealing transaction. And the reason is because, as a board member, I can't do that for the foundation or any or the company that I own can't do it either because the company is a disqualified person by the same rules as before. So, so, so you can't even pay people for things, with one exception. You can pay for what are called personal services that are reasonably compensated and necessary to the charitable purpose. Personal services are services that the, that the DQP does him or herself. So if, the hiring an accountant to do your books, hiring a lawyer to represent you in a, in a matter, um, anything where the, the board member's personal services are required, not just the company they own or something like that. So in this sense, you could even pay a board member for showing up to board meetings because their personal services are required. But that's the only exception for being able to pay people. Otherwise, any transaction, even if it's really generous on the part of the DQP, it's going to be forbidden. And so we penalize them. Well, how much do we penalize them? Same thing as before, um, but with different amounts. So if the disqualified person engages in a self-dealing transaction, we're going to penalize them by 10% of the total transaction value. So let's say I sold a piece of property to the foundation and I'm a DQP and let's say I sold it for $100,000. Well, we have to undo the transaction, meaning the, the, the foundation gives me my money back or gives me my property back and I give them the money back. But then on top of that, I have to pay $10,000 to the IRS. All the organization managers get penalized again for participating. So all the board members that approve the property purchase, they have to pay 5% of the total transaction up to 20 grand. And so that means that if they voted to approve the property sale of $100,000, the property sale has to be undone, but then all the board members that voted have to pay $5,000 to the IRS. And then finally, if, if we don't undo the transaction, we're going to penalize the disqualified person again, up to 200% of the total transaction. So if we don't do undo the sale, let's say I spent the hundred grand, so I can't pay it back. Well, now the IRS is going to penalize me $200,000 for not undoing the transaction. Oh, yeah, and how long do I have to undo the transaction? Usually it has to be undone within a year. So, so with those self-dealing rules in mind, let's see, what do you think? Are these transactions allowed? Okay, here's some examples. A corporation's foundation, okay, makes donations to a school where the corporation recruits. So let's say Ford Foundation is, well, I don't think Ford Foundation is an extension of Ford Motor Company anymore. So New Skin has the Force for Good Foundation. And New Skin um, <clears throat> recruits people at BYU. Well, let's say they make donations to the school at, to BYU. The that, so New Skin's foundation makes donations to BYU. Is this self-dealing? Uh, 
The answer is no. Is the transaction allowed? The answer is yes. This is an allowed transaction because the DQP rules don't apply here. Uh, the corporation is, is, uh, is a disqualified person, but the person receiving the benefit isn't, is not the corporation, it's BYU. So we're okay. Here, a DQP of a foundation is the highest bidder in that foundation's public auction. So as a fundraiser, you're having a public auction and one of your board members happens to win at the auction. It, is this transaction allowed? The answer is no. This is self-dealing. And it's self-dealing because this is a sale, exchange, or lease of property. It's the sale of property to the um, disqualified person. And as long as that's the case, it's, it doesn't matter even that it was a public auction at a fair rate. In fact, it could have been bid up to twice its market value. It doesn't matter. At that point, it's a sale of property. So this, the disqualified person should not have bought it in the auction. Okay, is this transaction allowed? A DQP uses a meeting room and a foundation, but the meeting room is available to the general public. Uh, the IRS has said that this is okay, but only because the room is available to the general public. If the DQP is using the room privately and it's not available to everybody else, then it would be a self-dealing transaction. Finally, let's say a foundation gives money to a for-profit company <clears throat> that's owned by a DQP to pay for exams and glasses for the needy. So you've got an optometrist on your board and you've decided, hey, we want to fund a bunch of eye exams and glasses for poor people. Hey, you're an optometrist. Let's pay you to do it for us. Um, well, if the optometrist is doing it directly, you might be able to argue that this is a personal service. But I want you to notice that the, that the money went to the corporation owned by the disqualified person. Well, in that case, it's not a personal service anymore. The corporation, however, is a DQP because it's owned substantially enough by the original DQP for the limitation to apply. And so this is a forbidden transaction by the IRS. Now, questions for class. Why are self-dealing rules a good idea or a bad idea? And why make them so complicated? Uh, we'll talk about that together in class. So thanks very much. I look forward to seeing you then.